Hello, my name is Albert Garcia, and I'm a librarian with the Contra Costa County Library, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Fall is for Planting. Today's program is a collaboration between the Contra Costa County Library and Our Water, Our World. And in just a moment, I'm going to hand it over to our presenters. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about the services, materials, and resources available at the Contra Costa County Library. The Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with our resources, services, and materials at all 26 of our branches, access more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections, and thousands of digital materials 24-7 at cccLib.org. Visit any library to use our public computers, printers, and free Wi-Fi. You can also visit one of our branches with laptops for on-site use or check out a Wi-Fi hotspot for three weeks. Contra Costa County Library's Adult Literacy Program trains and supports volunteer tutors to deliver basic literacy instruction to adults throughout the county. Visit our website and sign up for a digital library card today. And I'm happy to hand it over to Suzanne now. Thank you, Suzanne and Charlotte, for being here. Thank you so much. We are really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We're excited to talk to you about planting new plants in our gardens. Fall is for planting. And yes, uh, I am Suzanne Bontempo. I'm joined by Charlotte Kanner. We are IPM advocates and educators for the Our Water, Our World program. And the program throughout Contra Costa County is sponsored by the Contra Costa Clean Water Program. We're honored to be here in partnership with the library system. So thank you so much. So we're going to go through slides, I would say maybe about 40 minutes, maybe 45, but then we're going to leave time for your questions at the end. So we'll be together for about an hour this afternoon or this morning. Uh, what we're going to learn is we're going to review and provide you with an introduction to the Our Water, Our World program and a little uh, brief introduction to Integrated Pest Management or IPM. We are going to share why fall is is uh, why the fall season is the best time to add new plants to your garden. We will also share which plants are best, and then we will dive into how to set your plants up for success. So, as I mentioned, uh, we are in partnership with the Contra Costa Clean Water Program, which works to protect the Contra Costa County creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that might carry pollutants into the waterways. Related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and the garden areas and into the storm area by irrigation and rain. You can learn more about the uh, Contra Costa Clean Water Program at uh, ccleanwater.org. Thanks, Charlotte. All right, so our water, our world, uh, is a program that um, provides education about less toxic pest management. We are a statewide program as of last year, and we partner with retailers that sell pesticides, and we work with those retailers as well as the public to offer support and education around how to reduce pesticide usage, how to solve our pest problems in a way that's less toxic and more sustainable. We also provide integrated pest management education to the public, which supports that messaging. You can learn more about the Our Water, Our World program at ourwaterourworld.org. And you might recognize some of these materials in your local retailers throughout Contra Costa County. So waterways and our gardens. So I just like to back up and share. Uh, let's look at a, a watershed. So something we don't always think about when we're out and about, especially in our gardens, but a watershed is an, uh, an area of land uh, that any water that isn't absorbed into that ground will move towards uh, an area that could create a stream that might then flow to a creek, that might flow to a river, that might flow then to uh, a reservoir or an estuary, but always eventually to the bay uh, and taking with it any debris or leaf litter or anything that might be along its path will also get washed into that body of water. So how that relates to our gardens, is that uh, 
when we're using products around our properties, uh, such as pesticides um, and synthetic fertilizers, understand that there are little residuals that linger, that don't break down. And then when we actually have some rain, or if we have an irrigation break, or we might be power washing the house or washing the car, uh, the water from that are around our property can move across our property towards the uh, storm drain that's at the corner of the block or towards a regional creek, picking up those little residuals of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers with it, as well as other debris, um, litter, pet waste, motor oil, and things like that. So why we care about water so much is we like to reduce the pollutants that get into the waterways. So that's where the Our Water, Our World program steps in and provides education on how we can solve these pest problems and grow healthy gardens in a way that will not have those uh, residuals that can impact the waterways. So we teach integrated pest management or IPM. And what IPM is, is a decision-making process that allows us to look at a system such as the garden as a whole. We're always relying on science-based information. And, uh, and when we see a problem, for instance, it, you know, a leaf is getting nibbled, it, we want to take a minute to actually observe a little closer to identify what really is going on. That leaf is getting nibbled. Who's nibbling it? You might see a couple insects on that leaf. Let's say they might be ladybug larvae that we don't recognize. And we, without knowing, we can maybe inadvertently kill them by accident. So we always want to look at, you know, what is the problem uh, and understand who, who or what might be causing that problem. And then from there, we want to decide if it's something we can live with. Oftentimes these problems we see in the garden are very short-term or seasonal. And when we are growing a healthy ecosystem and growing healthy plants, we understand that plants can um, handle some damage, can actually handle some chewing by caterpillars. Uh, so oftentimes we just wanna learn to, to find ways to live with it because it's actually supporting the better health of the garden ecology. But with integrated pest management, we're always looking at how we could prevent problems such as planting plants in gopher baskets if we happen to live in an area that gophers are around, uh, setting up the irrigation systems uh, to really uh, you know, grow healthy plants and so forth, which we'll actually will talk a little bit about irrigation in a minute. But then identification is key. If we can't identify that problem, it will be really difficult for us to successfully uh, solve that problem or prevent that problem from happening again. And if we need to take action in IPM, the action steps are called controls. So cultural controls, which is increasing the health of that garden environment. This is really what we're going to be focusing on with today's program. We're going to dive into that. But then beyond that, there's mechanical controls or physical controls. These are the tools that we would use to prevent pest problems. Then of course, biological controls, which is inviting living organisms such as beneficial insects and birds to manage those pests and to help further support that healthy ecosystem. When we work with those three controls, we reduce pest problems significantly. In the event that there is a pest problem and we have exercised all of the other options, then yes, we can go for a chemical control, which is considered a pesticide. However, we always wanna use this as a last resort. There is a very rare occasion we would need to use a pesticide. We're always gonna use an eco-friendly. So with that, uh, and we're teaching another class on uh, fall pest management, which we'll dive into a little bit more. But really the takeaway here is uh, setting up the garden for success and working with tools and the uh, beneficial organisms of that ecology to reduce those pest problems and grow a healthier garden. Great, hey, thanks Suzanne for that intro. Um, that really does set us up to understand what we're talking about today. So yeah, today we're going to really talk about why fall is the best time for planting. 
I'll hopefully get you all excited. I know a few stores are ready that have some um, sales this weekend and over the next few weekends. So hopefully we'll get you excited about planting. Um, yes, we are in a weird uh, uh, climate here, I guess, in Contra Costa that unlike most of the Midwest and Northeast of this country where fall is actually the best time to plant um, because we don't get that super cold winter. Um, so yeah. So why is it uh, fall the best time to plant in Contra Costa and the Bay Area? Um, because when we're putting plants in the ground, we really want to set them up for success. We don't want to stress them out right away. So there's some things that happen in the fall uh, and the winter that will help uh, kind of ease them into our garden. Uh, there's shorter daylight hours, so they're not getting really strong sun um, like we have in the summer. They're just getting, you know, normal amount of sun uh, that they need to kind of get settled. Uh, and they're not really, plants don't do a lot of like above ground growing in the winter time. So really they don't need a ton of sun to, to be growing. Um, cooler evening temperatures, so keeps the soil cooler. Uh, hopefully there will be some wet weather, hopefully not too wet, but um, we'll, we never know where we're going to get these days. But um, ultimately there will be wetter weather or already has been some rain. Um, so that will increase the amount of moisture in the soil, less watering for us to do. Um, and, you know, just keeping that soil moist longer, which will explain why that's important. Then there's eight months or more until the heat, the peak heat of the summer comes back. So if we get our plants in in October, November, uh, we have until you know July, August to get that really hot summer. And by that time, hopefully our plants will be a little bit more prepared, have a stronger root system. Same with the dryness, 10 months, 10 or so months until the driest part of the season is here. So all this is just increases the amount of time your plants have to be in the soil, in the garden, getting established, uh, kind of growing up, doing their growing up um, and without the extreme stresses of summer. Um, so as I mentioned, we do kind of have a weird, uh, un not weird, but unusual uh, climate here in the Bay Area, especially in Contra Costa. We have, we can expect almost no rain during the summer. Um, and of course, that's where our hottest uh, months are, especially even later in the summer, getting quite hot. And then we expect rain from about October through hopefully March or so. Sometimes we get April, May rain as well. So that's what we can expect, hopefully. Uh, we'll see what happens this year. So then how are we gonna set up our plants for success? Besides planting in the fall, we're gonna choose uh, native varieties or plants that are going to be more um, uh, uh, accommodated to our, our climate, uh, acclimated to our climate. Uh, we're going to group plants with similar water needs together to make our life easier for watering and they are going to get the water needs that uh, watering that they need. We're going to water deeply and grow healthy root systems. We're going to maintain healthy soils and use mulch to protect soil and we're going to provide regular maintenance. So don't worry, I'm going to we're going to talk about all of these things um, now coming up. So first, when we're at the nursery, we're choosing climate appropriate plants. So the, often this is California natives, but not, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a California native. Uh, Mediterranean plants, uh, plants from South Africa, um, South America can all do really well in our climate because they all have similar climates to uh, what we have with our mild wet winters. Um, so choose plants that are going to be suited to our summer dry climate and mild winters. And then even within your own space, it's really good to study your own yard, understand the microclimates of your garden. Each garden is its own microclimate. And even within your garden, you have different areas up against the house. It might be hotter. Uh, you know, there might be a shady lower area that gets more moisture. There might be a wind tunnel area. Uh, so really uh, understand your garden 
Um, and also, you know, the sun changes throughout the year. Certain times you might, some areas will get more sun than others. Uh, maybe in the winter you get almost no sun. So uh, really understand what um, your plants are gonna go through where at each spot in the garden. And then, uh, you know, plant, right, the, sorry, planting the right plant in the right place, right plant, right place is what we say. Uh, if the plant, the right plant is in the right spot, it's in a spot that's suited to its needs. It's the right amount of sun, right amount of space, right kind of soil. It's going to be healthier. It's going to be happier. It's going to thrive. It's going to have fewer problems um, and fewer pest problems. So easier for you as well to take care of it. So we're gonna match plants to the conditions of the garden to keep them less stressed. We're gonna match the mature size of the plant. So when we buy them, they might look, they could be anywhere from four inches to a gallon or even five gallon. But we wanna read that little tag on the, that comes with the plant that talks about how big it's gonna get. Uh, we don't wanna put a big, a plant that's gonna get really big in a very small pot, uh, small spot next to other plants because that's going to cause overcrowding that's going to cause um you know pest problems they're going to become stressed there's not going to be enough, enough nutrients or water to um you know supply those plants so really understand how big that plant is going to get and understand that you know even if you want it to be you want to squish a bigger plant into a smaller spot just by cutting it back that actually is gonna increase stress as well. So we don't wanna just keep hacking at certain plants. Some plants do need to be cut back every year, don't get me wrong, but um, just hacking at a plant to keep it small can cause stress as well. And it can kind of look not very happy. So take all these into consideration when you're planting um, in the ground. And then of course, group plants by the plants needs, the sun, the water, again, is more, I've already said this and we're gonna say it again, hydro zoning, we're gonna put plants together that need the same amount of water. If we have plants that need, you know, no water in the summer next to a very thirsty plant, one or both of those is going to be very unhappy throughout the year. So we really want to group the less water use plants together. Even if, you know, a new plant goes in there. Uh, sorry, I don't want to say <laughs> that. So anyway, new plants do need more water. But anyway, we can, the long term, we want low water plants together with, and then higher water plants together in their own spot. Sorry, if I'm getting ahead of myself, there's just so much to talk about. Um, and then when you are choosing plants, consider, you know, not just, of course, the aesthetics, plants are beautiful, what we like to smell, what we like to see, but also understand that plants, different plants can provide different um, food, habitat uh, for other cre creatures in the garden, our birds, our butterflies, bees, uh, you know, even caterpillars that you know, will munch on the leaves, will turn into those butterflies. So understand maybe you will put in a plant that you know is going to get munched, but you know is also providing habitat for this um, kind of butterfly or moth that will bring um, benefits to your garden later. So um, yeah, consider all the beings, not just us, uh, when we're planting, because we can provide lots of food and habitat for the other creature, creature, creatures. And then um, a great great thing to do during the winter when we have that less light and cooler temperatures and more rain is to consider removing uh, part or all of your lawn and maybe putting in a lawn substitute. There are lots of different options, uh, you know, different fescues that can be look like that basically are grass, um, but they are um, more drought tolerant and need less water over time. Um, there's Daimondia, which is a nice, that bottom left picture, that silvery uh, carpet-like plant, or Creeping Thyme, which is uh, can be really beautiful, spreads really easily, feeds uh, pollinators, has beautiful little purple leaves, purple flowers, um, all great options for uh, reducing or substituting your lawn. And now is a great time to get that in the ground because uh, they will need significant water to become established. 
And for those of us that like to grow food, I being one of them, uh, this is an excellent time to get the cool season crops in. It might still seem early. It might seem like we, it's just still too hot. We're still getting 80 degree days, but trust me, uh, all of our cool season crops uh, are going to, you know, this is the time to get them in the soil because the soil is still warm and there is still, um, you know, long enough daylight hours to really help those uh, cool season food crops to become more established before the uh, cooler temperatures of the winter come on and before those daylight hours are even more reduced. So check out the Contra Costa County Master Gardeners website. They have this really great vegetable planting guide. Uh, this one, the snapshot I have is for interior region, but they also have it for the different regions of Contra Costa County, since Contra Costa County is a pretty uh, dynamic microclimate of its own. Uh, lots of you know different areas that can handle and tolerate different uh, plants and different plant care. I personally love planting garlic, shallots, and onions. This is the time of year to get those in. Uh, really, uh, I always shoot for that Halloween time of the year to get in my shallots and my garlic. Uh, I may have started my onion seeds already. And if I'm buying the onion starts or the onion sets, that's going to be right around the corner, uh, possibly January, maybe December. So check in with your garden centers to see if that was the way you'd like to go. But it's certainly a perfect time to get all of the, the seeds in for our garlic, our onions, and our shallots. And bare root season is just right around the corner. I love bare root season. So I'd like to share a little bit about it. Uh, bare root season is an incredible opportunity for us to buy plants that are not in soil. Uh, some nurseries and garden centers might uh, temporary, temporarily plant the, the, the roots in soil just to keep them protected. Uh, some might even pot them up for you. Uh, but it's a great opportunity for us to buy our deciduous fruit trees, uh, berries such as blueberries, caneberries, strawberries, uh, fruiting vines and perennial vegetables, you know, like artichokes and asparagus uh, at a very good price. So we're buying the bare root, we can plant them. And then in a couple of years, as they mature is when we start to see healthier, happier plants that are producing really high yields. And not just food crops, but also ornamentals. So ornamental trees and shrubs and vines, uh, roses, uh, we have dogwoods um, and clematis, but there's just so many. So I would encourage you to, uh, it's not too early to stop into your garden center and ask them if they have a list of the bare root plants they're gonna be bringing in so that you could do a little preparing and planning and to see if there's anything you might want to add to those spaces of the garden that you've been looking to uh, incorporate a little bit more, either food or flower or shade or just something beautiful. And then of course, uh, this is the time to get those spring bulbs, uh, spring bulbs such as the tulips, the daffodils, hyacinths and so forth. Uh, we live in a climate that they can thrive with ease, understand that daffodils uh, will naturalize and are deer resistant and gopher resistant. So those are my favorite. They uh, are pretty easy. They come back every year and I don't have to worry about those common pests. Uh, something to keep note is that um, because we are in a mild climate, if we are buying tulips, for instance, and uh, I believe the, the case is the same with hyacinths and maybe the crocuses, read the label. They may, they may need to be in our refrigerator in like maybe the crisper for a good four to six weeks before we plant them because they do need something that might be similar to, uh, you know, colder soil temperatures than what we have, you know, because they do thrive in, you know, areas that do get snow or that uh, have significant cold. So just keep that in mind and do a little planning, but really fun. You can see them all around the garden centers right now for sale great time to buy them, great time to consider planting them for spring color. 
And then for more resources uh, for plant lists or ideas or, you know, plant care, uh, there are some really great resources that we can share. The California Native Plant Society has an amazing website. Uh, they have a great database of plants such as Calscapes, calscapes.org, or you might look at Bloom California. They're all connected. Uh, and you can go through and look at the uh, enter in your zip code, the plants will come up that will be appropriate for your area, regionally appropriate, as Charlotte mentioned. And then you can go and decide if it's something that you would like to attract birds or butterflies or something that you're looking for trees or perennials uh, and so forth. It's really fun and it's uh, very easy to use. Of course, our local master gardeners, their website is uh, wealth of information, a lot of articles on how to grow and uh, troubleshoot when problems come up. Uh, the Arboretum All-Stars, which is the Arboretum at UC Davis, if you're not familiar with this resource, which is amazing, uh, they have a trial garden up there that really gets the most minimal of water uh, the most wind, the most heat you can imagine. And these are the plants that thrive. So if you're looking for some toughies that really can take all the elements, especially if you're out in maybe the more Eastern side of Contra Costa County, that is going to be your resource. And then of course, going to your local garden centers and seeing what they're bringing in and asking them questions and seeing what might thrive and work really well in your garden. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to plant and how to water. So yes, Charlotte and I love talking to people about how to water. So uh, we get a little excited and um, that's funny. Sorry, and I'm so having that's a why we're jumping ahead. I know that's okay. Why it's keep jumping, sorry. That's okay. okay. <laughs> this one is perfect. So when we buy a plant, I mean, it might sound silly, like why do we have to teach you how to plant? But this is something that we've learned over the years, talking to folks, uh, we see that people, and personally working in the garden industry for as long as I have, we find that some people uh, have some troubles or don't understand the importance of just the basic when we're buying a plant. So when we're buying a plant in a pot, we could take that pot off of the plant and we see that the root zone is the same shape as that pot. So we want to encourage those roots to grow out and down. So we're going to use our fingers to open it up that root zone gently, or we could take that plant tag that comes with the plant and we can, you know, score the sides and the bottom, whatever it takes to kind of open it up. If it's a larger plant that's really root bound or really tightly rooted, and we might even need to take our pruning shears closed in the closed position just to try to open it up a little bit. We don't want to disturb the roots too much. That is, we don't want to totally open up that mass, but we do want to encourage those roots to start to grow out, to get out of the shape of that pot. And then we're going to dig a hole that is just the depth of the, uh, of the original pot or the original root ball. And we're not going to go any deeper. We really want that plant to sit on firm soil. We will then backfill with soil that is mixed with compost. Charlotte is going to talk about those benefits in a moment, but we're mixing or amending that compost with our native soil to help get that plant off to a good start. We're always going to plant ever so slightly high. So when we do protect that soil with that nice two to three inch layer of mulch, that mulch will just uh, be focused on that root zone and not fall towards the crown of the plant. The crown of the plant is where the above ground parts of the plant or the stem or the trunk meet the roots. So we always want that area to be clear and free of plant debris and leaf litter. And if we're buying bare root, sometimes it's a little trickier to see where is that crown? Where are we planting? Uh, where the soil level should be, where it's meeting that root zone. So here is a bare root rose, and we can see the graph union, which is indicated with the red arrow. We are not planting at this level. This would actually kill the plant. That plant would probably last about three to six months, and then it would uh, perish. 
But if you see where the yellow arrow is pointing, that is the crown. That is where the roots start and the above ground stem meet. So that is going to be where we want to plant this rose. There's an illustration on the right. Uh, when we're purchasing bare root, I always like to ask at the garden center, the professionals that are working there, where is the soil level mark? Where is the crown? Because sometimes it's not that obvious. And then of course, when we plant instead of, uh, you know, there is no soil, there is no uh, root ball, so to speak. So we're actually gonna make a cone. Uh, we're gonna build a cone up with soil that's fairly packed. We wanna fairly pack it, you know, so that it has some structure. Imagine like we're making a structure at, uh, with sand at a sand castle. We're packing that bucket of sand and we can flip it over and it holds its structure. We're gonna do something really similar with our soil. We're gonna make that cone and we're going to uh, lay the roots over that cone. And then we're gonna backfill with that amended soil making sure that the crown is just ever so slightly raised above the soil level, or I should say the grade, we want it to be ever so slightly above the grade of the soil so we can allow for that mulch layer. And when we water newly planted plants, the very first time we've planted the plant, now we need to saturate that soil. It's the first time we're watering it and we're going to apply more water than you would imagine. In fact, several gallons of water. And the best way to achieve that, this from my experience, is we're going to take the hose, we're going to take any nozzles off the hose so that it's just the open hose. We're going to turn that hose on and we're gonna turn it down the volume of the hose, we're gonna turn that down to the lowest point to where just a little stream of water is coming out. And then we're going to place it at the outer edge of that plant. And we're going to let that water saturate down. In this illustration, it's going down 24 inches. And because of the uh, that structure of the soil, that water is able to actually uh, fan out about 14 inches. This is ideal, this is ideal. But we want to set the timer either on our phones or get a like an egg timer or whatever's gonna work for you. And after you know about 30 minutes or an hour, depending on how uh, easily that water is infiltrating, we are then going to, after that time, and we know we've been able to get that water down deep enough, we're then going to move it to the next location. If we were looking straight down onto this plant, we'd be looking at, imagine a clock, and we might go from uh, noon to three o'clock to six o'clock to nine o'clock. Uh, if the plant was larger, we might need to go from two o'clock to four o'clock, six o'clock, and so forth. If it's small, we might only need to go on two sides of the plant. But the idea is we want deep saturation around that full circumference of the plant. This is the first time we're watering. And the reason why is because that soil is dry and that soil is gonna wick out through the outer edges and beyond. But we really wanna make sure that that root zone gets well, uh, uh, properly hydrated. We are not focusing the water at the crown. We are not focusing the water at the very base of the plant it is always on the outer edges. And then moving forward, we are going to use water to grow deep and broad root systems. It's really important to uh, grow deep root systems. And we do that with water. Roots are only going to go where the water goes. So that when we have uh, days of excessive heat, the top few inches of soil, that water can evaporate out, but that root zone is still hydrated deeper down. When we are watering deeply, we don't need to water as often. We're watering less often. We are watering after the top few inches of that soil has dried out. And when we water deeply and less often, we're uh, saving water. We're not using uh, water. We're not using as much water as you'd think. You know, it seems like, boy, we're really doing, you know, applying all this water to the deep roots. Boy, that seems like a lot of water. But in fact, it is, we're watering less. We're using less water when we can practice uh, this. When we're watering shallowly and frequently, 
we actually are going to be causing that plant more stress because the top few inches of that soil, that water evaporates out, it's dry. If we have a hot day out of nowhere, that plant is dehydrated and is starting to get stressed. Over a period of time of this, that plant starts to show signs of this stress in the form of uh, fungal diseases or pests and so forth. And then it will of course lead to a slower decline of this plant's lifespan. So we always wanna focus that water on the outer edges of the plant as that plant grows. We are going to water those feeder roots, those root hairs that are, are around the whole circumference of the plant. And that's also where we're gonna focus our fertilizer, okay? Cause these are the areas, these root hairs, the feeder roots are what are going to take up the uh, fertilizing um, nutrients, as well as the water for hydration. And then uh, Charlotte mentioned hydrozoning, but I'd like to just uh, share why hydrozoning and plant selection is so important in relation to reducing pest problems. We always wanna group plants together with similar water needs, but also with the similar microclimate needs. As Charlotte mentioned, you know, we want full sun plants to all be planted together in the full sun. We want uh, plants that can take the heat of that wall to all be planted up against the heat of that wall, either the house, the garage, or maybe a fence. Uh, we want to plant plants that will require less water once established together and plants that like more water once established together. That might make sense, right? So let's say we have an area that's established and we've got a couple spots we wanna add a plant. Well, what do we do? We have a plant, an area that requires little or low water once established. And we're adding a couple more plants to that area that will match this need once they're established. Our irrigation is set up for low water once established. It might only be going on once a week. Maybe it's once every other week. You know, uh, so we have this new plant. We've just learned that new plants need more water until they become established. It could take, uh, you know, one to three years, depending on the plant material for it to become established. And during that time, we are babying it. We are really going to give it a lot of care and attention. And so we're going to hand water it. We are not setting the irrigation system up for the new plants. We're setting it up for what's established. And then we are going to uh, accommodate those new plants with the extra water until they have become established. I hope that makes sense. All right, and then a big part of watering is also, you know, relates to soil. And uh, what we can do during the fall and winter is really focus on our soil. Um, of course, when we're putting plants in the ground, we wanna make sure we're putting it into healthy soil. But I also find that, you know, having healthy, or it's fall and winter is just a really good time to focus on building up that soil for um, the coming spring and summer as well. So how we, do we build this healthy soil? First thing is to add compost. Now compost is the um, organic matter that's already been eaten by bacteria, fungus, microbes, worms, and other decomposers. It's not the food scraps, it's the finished kind of broken down material. You can uh, either make it yourself, you can buy it um, in bags at garden centers. Sometimes you can get it free from local uh, municipalities as well. And what soil is gonna do, I mean, what compost is gonna do for your soil is it's gonna improve the soil structure. It's gonna glue sandy particles together, hold it together so it can hold on to water and nutrients. And if you have clay, it's gonna break up those hard, packed in uh, mineral particles, break it up, add air and uh, water pore spaces. So it can help any kind of soil uh, be easier to work with and hold on to moisture and nutrients longer. Um, it turns your soil into a sponge. It increases that water retention. So if we do get a lot of rain this winter, if we have nice spongy soil. Uh, the water is gonna infiltrate quickly. So therefore less runoff, less pooling, less flooding. Um, it's gonna go into the soil and then it's gonna be held in that soil longer. So hopefully it can hold on to it throughout the um, summer or at least the beginning of the summer months. 
you're increasing the biology in the soil. Uh, we need life in that soil to feed our plants. The plants get fed by microbiology. Um, and if there was no life in that soil, our plants would not get fed. Just like our stomachs, we need uh, you know, gut microbes as well to break down our food for us, same in the soil. Uh, it balances pH levels. It re recycles nutrients from uh, garden and food waste. It reduces the need for chemical fertilizers and pesticides because you are building a healthier plant and it can even fight pathogens and bad bacteria in the soil. So ways to use compost um, in your garden, you can either mix it into existing soil. If you are planting, you can put it in the hole that you're planting in and mixing it with the native soil. You can take it and top dress around the drip line of plants. So just putting it either on top of the soil or if you have mulch, clear the mulch away, put the compost down and then cover back up with mulch and then water it in. It's gonna, um, those nutrients are gonna get watered into the soil. You can also consider making a compost tea, which is you know, water soaked with compost in either like a sock or some sort of mesh netting. Um, I recommend YouTubing it or looking up a little bit more about compost tea. Uh, it can be very simple and it, of course it can be very complicated too, uh, like everything. Um, but yeah, it can be a great uh, way to water your plants with added nu nutrients or create a foliar spray, spray on the leaves to increase the health of your plants. Um, you can also consider adding organic fertilizers as needed to build your healthy soil. Uh, we do recommend organic or slow release fertilizers. Um, these fertilizers are usually derived from organic matter like mushrooms, manure, bone meal, blood meal, and they're not derived from fossil fuels like other synthetic uh, fertilizers are. Um, they contain lots of micronutrients um, and they're released slowly to your plants. So, and the benefits is that they're feeding those microorganisms and the microorganisms are then eating that fertilizer, feeding it to your plants when the plants ask for it. And it really just provides slow, steady, hardy growth for your plants. Whereas synthetic fertilizers tend to be like steroids for your plants. Uh, these Organic fertilizers are like eating a healthy salad, you know, giving your, your body the uh, nutrients it needs to grow and be healthier. And as we've kind of already said, healthier plants have less pest problems and less work for you. So I do encourage that. Um, I will share that if you are planting California natives, I do recommend that you talk to either the local garden center or have a look at the California Native Plant Society and read up a bit more on the plant's soil needs because often California natives don't need as much soil amendment as other plants. So maybe less compost, less or no fertilizer. Um, but again, it, it depends on your soil, what your soil, what state your soil is in, what that plant needs. Um, so you might need a little you know amendment at first and to get it settled into the ground but again um i recommend looking at resources for california natives to kind of learn a little bit more about that when you're buying fertilizer just a quick note how to read the label all fertilizers have three numbers either on the front or the side somewhere on the packaging there are three numbers they always are nitrogen phosphorus and potassium in that order NPK, always in that order. And that tells you how much of each of those nutrients are in, uh, like relative to each other in that package. So if you want, you know, green growth upwards, we're going to focus on nitrogen. If we're focusing on root growth down or blooms, um, we can increase our phosphorus. And then potassium promotes all around well being. Great way to remember the NPK is. And what they do is up, down, all around in that order always. So um, hopefully that can guide you. I will say when you are first planting plants in the ground and you, especially during the winter, there's going to be more root growth, more underground growth and less above ground growth because it is cooler. So perhaps if you're first putting a plant in the ground, focus on something with a little bit more phosphorus to help that root growth um, expand out and down. 
Um, and then another great thing to add to your garden um, after you plant is mulch. Mulch is really any material covering the soil surface. I do recommend using a organic mulch, which would be anything made out of, you know, plant material, bark, wood chips, leaves, even straw and newspaper. Compost can be used as a mulch, um, a mulch covering. Um, all of these are going to add a lot of benefits to your garden. Uh, while oyster shells, gravel, and like landscape fabric can provide some covering and some benefits to the garden, for the most part, they it kind of their their benefits and their cons kind of uh, cancel each other out. Whereas if you use a organic mulch, you're really just getting benefits. Um, I will note if you are do live in a fire prone area, you do want to keep um, organic material, including mulch outside of zone one, which is the first five feet from your house. So uh, do be aware of that when you are spreading mulch as well. So some reasons we love mulch is that it protects the soil. If soil gets too dry, it can become um, hydrophobic. So if it's baking in the sun all summer and then you try to water it, that water, you're going to see that water just beads and runs right off of it. It doesn't actually infiltrate the soil. So if you're covering that soil with mulch, it protects it from um, creating a crust or becoming hydrophobic. And it kind of slows down the water so that the water can actually infiltrate a lot easier. A nice thick layer of mulch can reduce evaporation, um, especially in those very high temperatures, uh, two, like three inches of mulch can, can decrease your water usage um, like 20 to 30% just because of evaporation. It also regulates soil temperature, keeps soil cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter, and it reduces soil compaction and erosion. It, it protects it from being smushed and it protects it from uh, being blown away by, by wind or washed away by uh, rain, really important as we head into the um, rainy season. Uh, additional things, it prevents weed germination, also something to think about as we're entering the rainy season. It does break down and feeds the soil and it can provide beneficial insect habitat. Another way to build soil throughout the winter is using cover crops. This is great, especially for like uh, veggie gardens, areas that you're not actively planting, but you still want to keep, um, you know, covered or um, something growing in it. Uh, always having soil covered or something growing in it is going to ultimately lead to better, healthier soil. Again, we don't want bare soil being um, baked or washed away or uh, you know, hit with hard rain. We always want things covered. Um, I will say there's one exception. We do like a little bit of bare soil, maybe in the back corner, uh, just to uh, provide habitat for our ground dwelling native bees. Someone always asks me about that, so I have to share that. But generally, covered soil likes to be covered. Uh, so we can use cover crops, which are can be you know, pretty cheap seeds that we're not really growing for any other reason except for the benefits they add to the soil. And this can be fava beans, clovers, uh, sunflower, annual ryegrass, crimson clover is that one on the bottom, beautiful little red flowers and can add uh, nutrients to your soil. So cover crops add nutrients to soil, protects the soil from damage and erosion, feed soil microbes throughout the, the winter or whenever you're planting them. And it can replace, replenish nitrogen, which is really important, especially if you're planting like uh, tomatoes in the summer and other heavy feeders. It's also a great way to just have flowers throughout the winter available for your beneficial insects and keep feeding them. And it will continue to increase your soil structure and increase the water holding capacity um, in the soil. And then we'll talk about this in our fall pest prevention webinar as well, but fall garden maintenance, uh, you know, just maintaining the garden throughout the fall and winter. When you're out there planting, you also want to check your fruit trees, clean up any uh, fallen food crops, fruit, nuts, any old tomatoes or squashes in the garden. Make sure you're cleaning that up so we're not attracting 
rodents, yellow jackets, and uh, fungal diseases. We're gonna selectively prune. This is not really the time for heavy pruning. Uh, we're just going to prune out the dead, uh, dying, diseased branches, anything that could potentially cause a problem to the plant in a storm. And um, we're going to maybe consider leaving the leaves. This is going to be more uh, nutrients in your soil, um, more habitat for beneficial insects throughout the winter, uh, insulation for your soil as well. So you don't have to pick up everything. All right, and then a couple more tools. We're almost done, um, but a couple more tools to consider as you're planting. Um, irrigation systems can be really beneficial for uh, gardens at, in any season, in any stage. Um, you can adjust the controllers for the season. You can have it go off really early in the morning, which is great because we want to get that early morning watering into the soil before the heat of the day comes. Um, and they can be complicated, they can be simple, they can be on drip, they can be soaker hoses, they could be on sprinklers, you can uh, kind of have a, whatever system suits your needs. Um, but I do want to share that no matter what irrigation system you have, uh, whether you install it or someone else install it, you do want to uh, check on it regularly. It's not a set it and forget it system. You want to adjust for seasons. You want to adjust for plant growth. Um, as the plant grows, it's of course, you're going to move the irrigation emitters and you're also going to make sure it's you're still getting deeper watering less frequently as the plant grows. And then uh, as the seasons change, you might want to, you're going to change how often you're watering. You don't need to change how much water you get at one time. You still want to do deep watering, but as the, uh, you know, temperatures get cooler, the soil is cooler, there's less sun, uh, you can extend the time between waterings. Um, and then eventually, if we are getting rain, you might even be able to turn your irrigation system off for the winter. Though remember, if it is an unusually dry winter, we still, we might want to, you know, keep it on or turn it on manually uh, to keep um, our plants watered throughout the winter. I will share there is a rebate for a smart irrigation controller through Contra Costa Water. So I encourage you to look that up. Um, and, and a smart controller, you know, connects to your phone. It makes it so much easier to set the timing uh, and change the timing of your irrigation. Um, and then make sure also you're checking your irrigation throughout the year for um, leaks. Um, or things just not getting where they need to go. Uh, late in the summer around now is when rodents tend to get very thirsty outside. So they can sometimes, you can find that they bite uh, chew irrigation tubing um, because they are just desperate for water. So uh, that can be a cause of leakage. And of course we don't want to um, have you know, the whole point of drip irrigation is to have efficient watering, so we don't want to be leaking and wasting water. And then you can also consider switching from a pop-up sprinkler to a drip system. There are rebates to do this as well. And then we have some more online resources for you. Of course, the Our Water, Our World website, the UCIPM website, so I go there almost on a daily basis. Great resource for all pests in California. Um, identifying pests, really helpful. Um, another one, bugguide.net can help with identifying pests and then, or bugs, not just pests. And then um, the National Pesticide Information Center out of Oregon State is a really um, easy to understand guide for pesticides, the active ingredients, what their risks are, how they work. Um, so always good to read up on that. And all this information I think will go out to you if it hasn't already uh, with some other resources as well. So you don't need to write these down. We're gonna send them to you. And with that, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for the uh, to the Contra Costa Public Library for hosting us. We're excited 
to um, continue. We have more webinars already scheduled with the public library uh, in fall and in spring. So um, we're looking forward to continuing to work with you. And you are welcome now to uh, put any questions in the chat or the Q&A um, and we can answer them. Yeah, or even raise your hand. I believe that. Um, yes, if you raise your hand, I can go ahead and allow you uh, unmute you, and you can ask your question if you want. Thank you, Albert. You know, we always pack in a lot of information in our programs, so um, it is not unusual for us to, for people not to type things in immediately. But yes, looks like Margaret has her hand up. Margaret, you can unmute and ask your question. Okay. Might have been an issue with the microphone. Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I, I muted it, but if you want to try to unmute again, Margaret, but it was not coming through. <laughs> You could try typing out too. Yeah, you might want to try typing your question in the Q&A. Sorry about that. Yeah, sounds like an audio issue. But yeah, if you'd like to type your question in the Q&A, we'd be happy to answer it for you. And like Charlotte said, I'm going to send an email out to everybody who registered for this program with the link to the recording, which will be available on the library's YouTube channel, as well as the links and other resources that Charlotte and Suzanne provide to me. And we got a question, maybe Suzanne can address this. Can you, in regards to veggie planting, do I need a divider? I don't know exactly what that means, but. A divider between um, the plants. Um, if you could expand on that a little bit, what do you mean by a divider? Or do you need to divide the plants? Is that maybe what you're asking? If they're perennial vegetables, this is an excellent time, or any perennials right now throughout the garden, right now is an excellent time to divide your uh, perennial plants and um, replant them in other areas of the garden and go through the practices that we mentioned. And um, the only exception would be like uh, maybe cymbidium orchids or anything like that. You would want to wait um, oh, divider between each plant. So like carrots and beans, you don't need a divider between the plants. However, what I'd recommend is looking, I like to, uh, follow companion planting guides for my area, uh, so that when I can plant plants that will, um, not compete for nutrients in the soil, but actually use different nutrients so that they grow really well next to each other. So there's some information online about companion planting and compl companion planting charts. In fact, the um, Contra Costa County Marin, Mas I'm sorry, UC Master Gardeners might have that chart. Uh, but yeah, I like to follow that. And that's really um, all you'll need to do. You won't need to um, do any, you know, special division, you know, like separate them or keep them isolated from each other. You're welcome, you're welcome. And here's another question. Should I trim branches on my um, young Chinese pistachio tree maybe before fall? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so the trees that are deciduous and I believe that the Chinese pistache is a deciduous tree. Um, if it's deciduous, then uh, actually wait until all the leaves have dropped. I like to do my uh, deciduous tree pruning in like January or February, um, just so you can see the structure, there's no leaves to inhibit that vision. And you can really go through and, you know, prune out any dead or damaged wood, any dead or damaged branches and anything that would be crossing or causing the tree structural um, harm or, you know, uh, making it more vulnerable to damage like in a windstorm or something. 
if it is an evergreen tree, then this is a great time you can go through and do some pruning. You can also wait till the spring, uh, like March or April. Um, if since we are a few months ahead of like a January or February deciduous tree pruning, as Charlotte mentioned earlier, it's nice to go through and just selectively prune out any uh, branches or limbs or deadwood that might uh, cause damage if we do have a significant uh, windstorm. So we want to reduce the weight of um, like maybe the fruit from fruit trees or um, remove any dead branches that might uh, rip out and actually could cause damage to like the house or a fence or so forth. Oh no. Oh yeah. Okay. I tried to type some of the answer, but they also sounds like they heard it too. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. I like the Sunset Western Garden book, though I understand it's maybe not in um, print anymore, but you can get an older copy at the public library, uh, as well as other books on pruning. Uh, but the Sunset Western Garden book uh, does have a nice section about how to prune in the back of it, which is really helpful. And then, of course, reading about uh, the plant that you have, such as the Chinese pistache, you can read about um, its needs in the, uh, you know, the, the main section of the book. But in the back of the Sunset Western Garden book has some really wonderful um, tips and techniques for appropriate pruning. So I would definitely check out the local library to see what other garden books and uh books on winter pruning or just you know fruit tree pruning pruning vines just pruning plants in general because those are really helpful I personally am always referencing uh even now after you know 30 years of doing this I still like to just make sure I'm only pruning that you know plum tree won't see or I cannot remember uh where am I supposed to you know prune is it you know, new growth that I need to, that it's going to produce plums next year, or is it second year growth? So those are all the little things that, you know, we're not expected to remember everything. So that's why these uh, textbooks or these publications are really helpful for us to keep in our library, um, our personal library, or to check them out from the public library so that we can always provide healthy pruning practices and other healthy garden maintenance practices throughout our garden. That book that was Sunset Western Garden book, is that the title? Mm -hmm. I'm going to drop that link from our catalog into the chat, and I'll make sure that that gets onto the resource list as well. Oh, great. There's uh, many publications, though. I, Charlotte, are you aware? I believe they're not making print publications any longer. Um, I remember. I'm not I, sure. They I heard have, something about that. but This is a 2007, so I don't think we have anything newer than yeah, that. Yeah, well, that one's, I mean, they're all valuable. I have three different publications from three different years, and they all, I mean, the information is uh, still relevant and very valuable. Cool. So thanks for dropping that link in. All right, any other questions that we can help you with? Well, our contact info, I think, will be on the resource um, page as well. So if anyone has any other questions, they're welcome to contact us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susanna Charlotte. That was a wonderful program. We really appreciate it. And again, this will be this recording will be um, posted to our YouTube channel tomorrow, and I'll be sending out a link either tomorrow or Monday with uh, with all the information that we talked about. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for joined us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much, Albert. We really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.